Good afternoon. Welcome to CSIS. My name is Andy Cutchins. I'm director of the Russia and Eurasia program here at the Center for Strategic International Studies, and it's a great pleasure for me to welcome you here this afternoon to discuss after South Stream, Turkish Stream. Now, I think I've heard some people refer to this as potentially a pipe dream. I've even heard some colleagues use another modifier before dream to refer to this issue. But we're not going to go there. We have a terrific panel today. Um, <clears throat> let me just uh, say a couple of comments. It was, a, I think, a surprise for most of us in December 2014 when Mr. Putin in Russia announced that it was canceling its South Stream gas pipeline project a project that uh, the Russian government had been promoting for since at least 2006, a project which, uh, by my understanding, I think the Russians had invested about $5 billion into. And, uh, but on a trip to Ankara, Mr. Putin unveiled a new pipeline project that would send additional gas to Europe through Turkey to the Greek border, which was dubbed Turkish Stream. There's been a lot of speculation as to the potential winners and losers of this decision. There's been speculation as to whether South Stream is indeed uh, uh, fully canceled. Uh, there are questions about whether Turkish Stream is a more viable pip pipeline project. Will it lessen or exacerbate Europe's energy security concerns? And what are the geo broader geopolitical concerns about this project? I think it would be hard to find a better set of panelists to uh, discuss this today. And let me briefly introduce them, all three of them, before we turn over to uh, Dr. Nadja Padikova uh, to make the opening presentation, kind of outlining what the project is all about, supposedly. Uh, Nadja Padikova has held senior positions in the Turkmenistan government, served on a number of high-level trade and energy commissions of the former Soviet states, and participated in feasibility studies for hydrocarbon development. Her knowledge of European, U.S., Russian, Iranian, Turkish, and Chinese policies in the former Soviet Union have contributed to assessments of political and financial risk, geopolitics, energy development, and business and government relations. She has served as a senior advisor at the Institute of Developing Economies of, the, of JETRO, Japan External Trade Organization in Tokyo, and many, many other institutions uh, uh, and other positions. Uh, she is the, the director and president of Onteris Strategy, and even more relevant uh, for our purposes today, she is a uh, non-resident senior associate affiliated with the Russia and Eurasia program of the Center for Strategic and International Studies, us, CSIS, in working with us as we develop our Eurasia initiative. Uh, following Nadja's introduction, I will turn to a longtime colleague and friend, Ed Chow, who is an international energy expert with more than 30 years of oil industry experience. He's worked in Asia, the Middle East, Africa, South Africa, Europe, and the former Soviet Union. And he has developed policy and business strategy and successfully negotiated complex multi-billion multi dollar international business ventures. He specializes in oil and gas investments in emerging economies and advised the U.S. and foreign governments, international oil companies, multinational corporations, multilateral agencies, and international financial institutions. And uh, following Ed will be uh, also a longtime friend and colleague here at CSIS, uh, Bulent Alaritsa, who's the director and senior associate of the Turkey Project, uh, which uh, he has been directing for a number of years here at CSIS, lectured widely in the US as well as in Turkey, as a frequent media commentator on Turkish foreign policy and Turkish domestic politics. Let me just say in a word, if I want to know anything about Turkey, I go to Bulent. Uh, so with that uh, brief introduction, let me turn the floor over to uh, our speakers who really know what they're talking about. And uh, first of all, Nadja. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Andy, for such a kind introduction. And it was interesting, sometimes interesting to listen about yourself and so on. Um, so today our subject is uh, Turkish uh, stream. Probably uh, we should not uh, talk about, um, more talk about what happened before. 
Uh, but anyway, let's, I will try. I, it's a very complicated topic. But anyway, I will try to touch on only some issues. And, um, and after that, we will see how it will work. So you see on the screen, South Stream. It was a huge um, project, very big, and three parts. It was canceled. So it was canceled not because of the price of oil, not because of it's too expensive, but it was canceled exactly because it was uh, serious. Um, um, the Gazprom faced serious uh, legal um, issues in the, in the, in Europe. Just could not continue because in 2011 EU introduced um, the third energy package. So that's why it was cancelled. But it's uh, still alive or not, I think it's cancelled completely because it was, you know, um, useless to continue to work, to have a huge project. And um, the third part in EU, EU um, uh, the third part of the uh, pipeline, it should be in EU territory and a phase um, a lot of restrictions. So that's why uh, the project, next project is uh, um, Turkish uh, stream pipeline. And this information which you see right now, this is information based on, um, um, provided by Gazprom on January 27, 2015, based on that information. So it is the same project, but much smaller. And if you look at the offshore uh, part of this project, if I go back, you see about the same, uh, the sh same shape of the pipeline. Only the small part of this uh, uh, project, it will uh, just turn and uh, direct it towards the, the Turkey. Um, as you see, 600. Uh, kilometers, more than 600, it will be the old route of the South Stream. On only 250, it will be new one. The same pipe, it's, a, I believe, 32 inches, and um, as well, three, uh, four strings. It's very smart to use the same route, because before, Russia already spent money to, for feasibility study, for preparing all uh, jobs in order to start build the project. As I knew that uh, uh, Gazprom already had a two contracts with a, two contracts with a two companies. One is a Italian uh, Saipem and a, another European company to build this uh, pipeline and spent. Yes, it's about five billion uh, U.S. dollars. Um, but what uh, spent for buying? Um, pipelines and um, and frachting some you know barge so they can um, indeed recoup some equipment may, maybe not um, completely or not all of this so the first string it will be only for uh, Turkish market but there's no uh, intergovernmental agreement uh, agreement will be signed in the second quarter of 2015 or only um, but according to information which was provided by the Gazprom and as well the officials, that Turkey, uh, okay, Turkish market will uh, receive uh, in uh, December 2016 gas, uh, the first gas, but beyond 2019, uh, no Russian transit gas will cross Ukraine. So it seems to me it's, you know, this very optimistic, um, optimistic, you know, uh, plan. Uh, so if you see the share of uh, the Russian gas transit to Europe through Ukraine, it's already it's, uh, dropping. And uh, every time when they have a new pipeline or a new direction or new entry point, the share of uh, Ukraine, I mean transit um, of Russian gas through Ukraine, it's getting smaller and smaller. And they believe that after 2019 it will be zero. Um, but as I said, it's uh, too optimistic uh, for uh, this uh, time frame. And why, I will try to explain. Uh, yeah, definitely they can build two strings and maybe one or two. There's a market for that. It's a, a Turkish market. And as well, uh, they can um, provide uh, from the second string to the uh, southern part of the Europe. But anyway, if you look at the Russian major pipelines, and you will see that the pipeline which across the Ukraine, um, and um, which is supposed to be canceled but after 2020, you will see that the main energy hubs in the center of Europe. 
So, but as soon as they build the pipeline, Turkish uh, stream, the energy hub will switch immediately to the south. It will be in Turkish territory. And Gazprom announced that they will sell gas on a border between Turkey and Greek. There is no additional pipelines will be in the European territory. If the European customers need gas, they have to come and buy. But it's uh, too optimistic and uh, not probably responsible even for, for, for this time. Uh, because it's, um, it's about, I'm not sure, 14 or 13 EU uh, countries um, receive the... Um, Russian gas through, uh, through Ukraine. So some of them, all of them, it's long-term you know, contracts. But some of them, it's long-term contracts, delivery points with it, exactly delivery points. And uh, you see this uh, um, mark on, on, on the map. And uh, will continue in force beyond 2020. So there's a question how uh, Gazprom will manage this. I know that the Gazprom is a very responsible um, supplier, and I don't believe that they will, uh, you know, uh, drop any contract. So, so there's a question whether Russia, whether Ukraine, uh, whether the Gazprom will be able to find some other sources or how they will manage this. So that's why I think that if the Russia build a, a third and fourth strings, it probably will be and, um, something beyond 2020, if maybe they will come up with something, you know, something uh, more interesting. So what happened to Ukraine? So when we talk about the losers and the winners, it seems to me the, the main loser in this case will be Ukraine. So Ukraine and um, there's no point and no ground anymore to call Brussels and ask to block any projects, pipeline projects, which will bypass um, Ukraine, as for instance, um, Yitzhak said last year, he called Brussels a block to uh, South Stream because South Stream is against um, uh, Ukrainian transit uh, routes. So uh, I don't believe that it's uh, that's, that they will ask uh, uh, Turkey to do the same. And, and definitely uh, Ukraine will lose and more income and uh, finally probably will be zero. And trade moves, uh, if we uh, check the, with the Turkey. Turkey will get about the same amount of gas, but they can, of course, buy more from Russia. But only the difference will be that uh, Trans-Balkan pipeline, Trans-Balkan gas, which uh, comes uh, through um, Ukrainian territory, it will go uh, through directly um, uh, Turkish stream. So there is no uh, gas in Turkey which will come, will go through the, run through the, the um, uh, Ukraine. Um, but uh, it's okay. There's a, a lot of, you know, speculation that uh, uh, Turkey will depend on Russia. It's not maybe good or bad. I don't think that it's a problem. It will be no problem with that. And uh, Turkey can get more gas from uh, Russia, but if Russia build the third and fourth string, and Russia will more depend on Turkey, there will be mutual dependence. So there's no point even discuss it. Uh, so, and after that, Um, it's domestic market's okay and fine that uh, uh, Turkey will get more gas and will directly, and it's security. But, um, but Turkey is a winner in this project because uh, Turkey already uh, recognized by EU as a key state, in, um, as a key transit state, and TANAP uh, runs through Turkey. So it's a huge project. And of course, it's... Uh, Still, um, still not well developed. But anyway, uh, Turkey already um, transit state and try to talk and negotiate with the countries like, for instance, Turkmenistan, and it has already um, framework agreement to supply gas, more gas to to Tana. Um, so, if uh, the uh, Turkish stream will. Uh, built and Russian gas will um, 
sent transit to Europe through Turkey, and as well, at the same time, Turkey will stay and will be uh, the key transit country in a southern corridor. In this case, in a while, we can see that Turkey can become the huge um, gas, um, the, the country which will control the gas um, flow to Europe, not just the gas hub, because we'll be at the same time control two different um, major uh, gas transit routes. But the difference between the um, South Stream and the uh, um, uh, Turkish Stream and sou Southern Corridor, that Southern Corridor's uh, project supported by EU, it looks like EU helps itself, but it helps as well Turkey to become uh, a key player in this region. So and Turkey in a very good position right now. On the one hand, it's Russia. Yes, needs the Turkish territory to send gas to, to Europe. On the other hand, it's the uh, EU. So, um, if we, and uh, it's again, uh, it's only speculations, and I believe that the first maybe two uh, strings will be built, and because uh, there's, a, uh, as I said, um, market, uh, there's uh, some market for Russian gas in Turkey, and as well, uh, the second string, maybe it's uh, around 15, 16 BCM, they can find market in the southern part of the Europe, or maybe even use the, um, the same pipeline um, to, for reverse flow. I mean, the pipeline um, which now serves to get the, the, the gas from uh, uh, from Russia through Ukraine. So in these numbers, but maybe 2019, when you see that number, maybe I should put there 2020. And I believe that 2020, it will be only two strings because I I'm, I'm doubt that there will be market for additional for, for 30 PCM gas uh, just because the Russia will sell gas on the border, not because of no, uh, no um, uh, demand over there because the Russia really wants to cancel uh, all transits through through Ukraine. But anyway, you can see that Southern Corridor, and um, this is a trade movement, the, the gas which will flow through Turkey to um, Europe, it's a Russian gas and a gas as well from the Southern Corridor, Azeri gas, maybe potentially Turkmen gas, maybe potentially it will be Iranian and Turkish gas, uh, Kurdi Kurdish gas as well. But uh, it's only potential, even if you take it all of them and keep only uh, um, Azeri, it means that anyway, it will be, uh, it's a huge difference. Um, uh, Southern Corridor will be, for instance, only 10 BCM, but uh, the uh, Russian transit route, it will be 50 BCM, so a huge difference. You can see the power which, for instance, Russia could have in this case. But as soon as the Southern Corridor will, um, will develop, if develop, and um, that's, in this case, uh, 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 Turkey will become more powerful uh, in this um, in, in this case. So, and uh, the last point is that uh, Turkey tried to um, convince uh, Brussels there is no threat, no problem with the uh, uh, Turkish stream, that everything is fine. There is no threat to the EU interest in the, in the Caspian area, but um, but we will see if the EU shares the same level of uh, comfort as uh, Turkey. So maybe I will stop here. And uh... Thank you very much, Nadia. That was very comp comprehensive and, and concise. Uh, excellent uh, opening. Ed, the floor is yours. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Andy. Um, when Andy had this brilliant idea to host this event, I campaigned very hard to have it on Groundhog's Day. Um, and, and those of us who have been watching uh, pipeline developments um, uh, since 1992, um, have seen this movie before. Um, and, and maybe 
as Bill Murray did in that movie, uh, we will learn as more facts become known. Um, I thank Nadja very much for a very good summary of what we think we know about the project so far. Um, there's a lot of information that still, uh, we're still waiting for, uh, even since uh, the meeting in Ankara last week. Um, um, and um, it, it, it does have a feel, uh, it seems to me, of Russian improvisation uh, in, in, in all of this. You know, I may be wrong, uh, but the announcement seemed to have shocked, if not awed, uh, Gazprom's Italian, French, and German business partners, uh, as well as governments along the route of the original South Stream, uh, in particular Bulgaria, Serbia, and, and, and Hungary. And from the looks on television um, of the uh, announcement, maybe Alexei Miller was a little surprised uh, as well. He certainly wasn't able to answer questions. Uh, that reporters asked him um, after uh, the announcement on, on December 1st. So it, it's been kind of a, a, a parlor game uh, recently in the West, including in Washington, uh, to talk about what is Mr. Putin thinking, what does he really want, not what we think he should want, but what does he want and what's he thinking. So I've been trying to channel Mr. Putin recently um, uh, to a point where I actually dreamt last night that I was Mr. Putin. <laughs> and, and I woke up three times during that nightmare last night. Uh, so I have three distinct scenarios on what Putin is thinking. So uh, take a flight of fancy with me, if you will. Uh, so scenario number one um, is um, I, Vladimir the first, am a man of my word. If I say we're going to build a pipeline to Turkey, we're going to build a pipeline to Turkey. Um, since the pipe gas prom ordered um, for the first strand of South Stream is already at the yard in, ironically, Varna, uh, Bulgaria. And the lay barge from Saipam is already in place in the Turkish Straits. That money is already spent. Uh, we may as well build this pipeline to Western Turkey. Uh, that way, the additional volumes, and Nadja pointed out, uh, that, that currently goes through Ukraine and the Trans-Balkan pipeline can bypass that road altogether to the Turkish market, which is the only market in Europe that's really growing. If things go well, we will build a second line to serve the southeastern European market, the Balkan market, to which we also have a monopoly. Together, that makes up 31 BCM, billion cubic meters, which was the original conception of South Stream. Those of us who remember uh, will, will know that it was 31 BCM project all along until I really scared Miller one day by raising the capacity to 63 BCM after the 2009 Ukraine gas crisis. Well, one day when oil is at $250, which at Lake Say actually predicted in June of 2008, maybe we can build a 63 BCM uh, system. Then I woke up um, and said to myself, well, that option is still too expensive. It still will cost tens of billions of dollars. Uh, the original South Stream project was supposed to cost 40 to 50 billion. Yes, we've sunk a fair amount of change already in this project, but can I really afford to do this big mega project? So let's play it safe. Let's build a line along the shorter and therefore cheaper Blue Stream route, which you can see on, on the map in front of you, to serve the Turkish market. Then if things go well, we will build a second line. The problem with this option is that we would then have to rely on the already inadequate Turkish internal pipeline system uh, to transit gas to the Balkans. 
and I would have to trust the Turks. Well, maybe that's still better than the Ukrainians. Then I went back to sleep. And I woke up with a start. And I said to myself, what, am I crazy? We don't have money to build any new pipeline under the Black Sea. We better concentrate on building that gas pipeline to China. It is just as expensive, but we need it for the Power of Siberia project, which is so integral to my uh, vision of developing the uh, Russian, uh, part, uh, Asian part of Russia. Most of that cost will be ruble denominated. And my friends who do contracting in Russia are desperate for work. At least they are not dollar or euro denominated as German pipes and Italian lay barge uh, tend to be. And you know, I keep looking at this new Chinese president, Xi Jinping. He looks really serious. And I've signed two agreements with him last year. How, ever, how did he ever acquire $4 trillion in international reserves? I've got to remember to ask Kudrin that question the next time I see him. His foreign reserves are more than 10 times mine even before the oil price drop. I better stay close to China uh, while this war in Ukraine is going on. I better tell Miller to name this pipeline Turkish Stream so that when it fails, it's, at least it's not a Russian stream project. Um, and I hope Erdogan has forgotten that I've reneged on pipeline projects in Turkey before. Uh, remember the Samsung Jehan oil pipeline when we were all seemed to be so eager to bypass the Bosphorus? Um, in the meantime, we'll muddy the waters for the Azeris on their TANAP and TAP uh, ambitions to bring Azerbaijani gas to compete in our market in Turkey and Southeastern Europe. I better remember to call Athens when I wake up in the morning. So um, in all seriousness, I actually did wake up last night and, and wrote a commentary, which is on the CSIS website this morning. So you can see a more slightly more serious version of, uh, of these uh, three scenarios, which are as scenarios uh, are supposed to be not predictions so much as three separate cases uh, uh, and the key factors behind the three separate cases for all of you uh, to consider. My big takeaways are, and I agree with Nadja on this, is that at best we're talking about a 31 BCM system. There is no 63 BCM uh, project anytime soon. Therefore, Russia and Ukraine are stuck with each other for a while. Ukrainian transit last year, even in a very down year, was 59 BCM of uh, transit from Russia through Ukraine uh, to European markets. So you're not going to be able to replace all of that in the next five years, like it or not. Um, uh, they, they are, those two countries are stuck with each other. Um, there's real questions on Turkey's uh, gas storage capacity. Turkey has barely enough gas storage capacity to handle uh, its increasing imports of gas. It would cost hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions, to, to if you really want to build up gas storage to the level of being able to transit 50 BCM gas uh, uh, across Turkey uh, to markets uh, be beyond. Uh, Nadja already brought up the point of contract delivery points. Uh, Mr. Uh, 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 Shefkovich was uh, uh, amazed when he was in Moscow uh, on the 17th, I believe, of January, where uh, Novak um, and, uh, and Miller and Dwakovich told him that it was Europe's job to take that 50 BCM of gas away from Turkey. Well, who's going to do that? Um, the fact of the matter is, unlike oil pipelines, gas pipelines are not financeable without 
creditworthy parties providing financial guarantees to ship a volume of gas through at least the amortization period of any loans uh, for, uh, on, a, on a ship or pay basis on the part of the producer shipper, in this case it would be Gazprom, uh, which uh, if you look at their uh, uh, earnings last quarter, the third quarter, which is what they reported uh, a week ago, earnings in rubo terms dropped by more than half. Uh, you can imagine what it would be in dollar terms. Um, and also, uh, the, the pipeline uh, to be financeable would require financial guarantees for buyers of gas on a take or pay basis. Uh, and who's going to do that at the Turkish border? So there are a lot of questions that remain unanswered or unanswerable for now. And of course, I'm sure all those answers lie in Ankara. <laughs> So, Bulent, <clears throat> what were you dreaming last night? I, I wasn't dreaming about Putin, thank God. <laughs> um, yeah, I tend to be uh, uh, much more on the Ed skeptical side than the Najah optimistic side when it comes to, to this new project. As Ed said, uh, we go back uh, a long way to, uh, um, to the breakup of the Soviet Union and how um, Caspian region oil um, with Chevron, where Ed used to work in Kazakhstan, in Tengiz, and then uh, Amoco, and then of course uh, uh, Amoco with BP, as BP Amoco got involved with the mega project in, in Azerbaijan, and that uh, brought Azeri oil, um, which along with Kazakh oil, um, was inaccessible to, uh, uh, to the outside uh, um, parties interested in. Um, exploiting this oil, um, on to unconsciousness, uh, into calculations, and, um, and eventually into, uh, into realization in, in the form of, of BTC. Um, anyway, what I propose to do is, is to go beyond the two presentations uh, uh, before and, uh, and look at the broader picture. Of course, I'll touch on the Turkish aspect of the equation, uh, but I will also talk about the implications for the Ankara Brussels Washington, as to say, the Turkey EU uh, US um, uh, triangular relationship and how uh, this fits into the energy component of, the, of that relationship. Um, and p particularly when it comes to uh, diversifying gas supplies to Europe, uh, which all three agree on, uh, by further developing the East West Energy Corridor and thus bringing European consumers Caspian gas. But let me go back a little bit. Uh, um, I think it's, it's important to uh, look back at how the East-West Corridor came into being, because it has relevance to, to our discussion today. Exactly 20 years ago, Turkey and the United States began a, a very close and, and frankly unprecedented collaboration in the post-Cold War phase of their long relationship as allies on the issue of energy transportation. This cooperation helped Turkey to gain for the first time a role for itself in the global energy equation as a key, it's not a producer, but it was a key, it became a key energy transit country, and also helped to bring into being what eventually uh, came to be known as the Baku Tbilisi Jehan pipeline to take Azeri oil to markets through Turkey, specifically through the uh, Turkish Mediterranean port of, of Jehan. Although the project was vociferously opposed by Moscow, uh, it frankly was too weak to, uh, uh, to block it. Uh, the U.S.-Turkish cooperation encouraged and protected the two newly independent states, ex-Soviet states involved, namely Azerbaijan as producer and Georgia as the key conduit through the Caucasus to Turkey. To proceed to the completion of the BTC project in 2005 as the first manifestation of the East-West Energy Corridor. Of course, it also, on the, in addition to tying them to, uh, to the West um, through this pipeline, um, it, uh, it underlined their independence from Moscow, saved them uh, from, uh, or you know, obviated the need to use uh, 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 the ex-Soviet pipeline network, uh, which you know uh, Moscow was pressing them to do, uh, while leaving aside the Iranian option, that, uh, as uh, Ed could tell you, was much cheaper from the point of view of the producers at that stage. But the political uh, cooperation between Turkey and the United States helped 
uh, to uh, create the right circumstances in which um, uh, the, the project came to fruition and establish, as I said, the East-West Corridor. The plan was uh, for this to be followed by a gas pipeline that would bring Azeri gas from Shah Deniz, uh, to Europe, Shah Deniz in Azerbaijan again, to Europe. To be sure, in 2006, Azeri gas began to flow to Turkey through the South Caucasus pipeline, otherwise known as the Bakr Tbilisi Erzurum pipeline, with a firm expectation that this would be the first stage of a pipeline system all the way to Europe, as the now dead Nabucco project and the current TANAP project uh, envisaged. Needless to say, both the EU and the US gave their support to Turkey and Azerbaijan, and to even Turkmenistan in the hope that this gas, that uh, their gas would uh, eventually go into what became known as the Southern Corridor pipeline. For its part, Turkey also talked about Iraqi Kurdish gas and Iranian gas eventually being added to, to the mix, and there was even speculation about Israeli and Cypriot gas once the major political obstacles in their way, if ever, were solved. However, just as the East-West Corridor was getting on the way, uh, and this is really important, over Russian opposition, Turkey moved in 1999 to balance its energy links. The Blue Stream Agreement uh, in that year strengthened Turkey's existing north-south energy connection to Russia by bringing 16 BCM uh, of uh, additional Russian gas to Turkey through a pipeline under the Black Sea. This amount was on top of the 14 BCM that Turkey was getting through a pipeline uh, you know, perversely named the Western Pipeline. Guys, I guess when you're uh, pumping it in Russia, it is the Western Pipeline, although it really is part of the North-South um, uh, um, uh, Corridor. Traversing Russia, is, excuse me, Ukraine, Romania, and Bulgaria, and thus ensured that Russian gas would continue to account for more than half of Turkish consumption. I checked through the figures. Uh, we don't yet have the, the final figures for 2014. Uh, but for the last, uh, for the two years before that, the overall Turkish gas consumption in BCMs, and it's not growing yet, it's, uh, it's pretty much stagnant. It's 46 billion cubic meters uh, in both years, there or thereabouts. It went up just slightly. Uh, the total Russian share was 58% um, in uh, 2012, um, which is 26.49 BCM, and 57% uh, in uh, 2013, which is 26.2 billion. And the breakdown for that was uh, the blue stream component of that was 14.7 uh, billion in uh, 2012 and 13.35 uh, um, uh, in uh, 2013. And the maximum for blue stream is, of course, 216. Um, they came close to that. The western line was 11 point, for the two years was 11.79 and 12.85 in those years. Uh, for compar in comparison, the Azeri gas, of course, was much more limited. It, it was 3.35 in uh, uh, 2012 and 4.2 in uh, 2013. Now, the, uh, my understanding is that the figures are not going to be uh, uh, very different in 2013, uh, excuse me, 2014, and interestingly, uh, the projected uh, consumption in 2015 uh, is at 51 uh, BCM, and I doubt, uh, given the, uh, uh, the low economic growth in Turkey, uh, whether they're actually going to, to reach this. Now, leaving aside for, uh, for a moment the feasibility of the Turkish stream project to bring Europe the projected 47.25 billion cubic meters of the 63 billion cubic meters that is supposed to be delivered at the Turkish-Greek border, and Ed went into this at, at length, so I won't. Um, Gazprom expects to begin delivering annually, increasing volumes as of December 2016 to Turkey, ultimately reaching 15.75 billion cubic meters. The question, therefore, that I'm focusing on is the extent, extent to which the Turkish mar market would be even more dominated by Russian gas uh, if Turkish stream materializes, or even if it doesn't, then we go with Blue Stream 2, uh, and how much room it will allow for additional Azeri gas to, to Turkey. Frankly, there is a complication when it comes to, to Azeri gas coming to Turkey and uh, uh, Azeri gas going through Tanap to well markets that we simply did not have uh, before Turkish stream came in, uh, uh, in you know, through Putin's visit uh, into the equation. Uh, it's worth noting that last year, Turkey uh, and Russia agreed to increase the, the capacity of Blue Stream to 19 billion cubic meters. So there's already plans to, to expand on Blue Stream. Ed. 
To be sure, Turkey has been assuring Azerbaijan and the, um, the companies involved um, in the TANAP project along with it that Turkish stream will not affect TANAP uh, either with respect to the Turkish purchases through this pipeline or the projected volumes through, its, uh, uh, through the pipeline through its territory to Europe. However, it's worth noting here that just yesterday the Turkish energy minister conceded that the, Turk, uh, that the two projects would compete and he characterized that competition as healthy. Now, it has to be stressed that Turkey's priority from the outset has been on playing the role uh, of an energy hub and the firm belief that in addition to its commercial benefits of involvement in the, uh, in the transportation of energy to markets, the multiplicity of pipelines traversing its territory would enhance Turkey's importance in international relations. Turkish stream fits naturally into that narrative, whether it comes into being or not, and um, it's uh, interesting that uh, Ed reminded us that there was the Samsung Jehan pipeline, which was launched with much uh, ballyhoo, and you know, nobody talks about it today. And going back further, we had Nabucco. You know, how much uh, ink was spent talking about and, uh, and analyzing Nabucco, which never came into being. And then, of course, we had South Stream. So, you know, just drawing lines on maps does not bring pipelines into, into being. Now, another goal the, um, uh, for Turkey is to maintain good relations with Moscow, a former historic foe in imperial days, as well as during the Cold War. Uh, this has been important. Uh, uh, an important goal, not just to the government in uh, Ankara, not just the current government in Ankara, but also to its predecessors. Russia is a very important trade partner, and there's over $30 billion in trade, which is skewed very heavily in favor of Russia. I think it's $24 billion to $8 billion because of the gas which is par uh, purchased by Turkey. Um, and this is something that uh, uh, Prime Minister, then Prime Minister Erdogan stressed dur during the Georgian War of 2000 eight, as he explained why Turkey would not take sides in that dispute. Although the two countries find themselves on opposite sides of a number of important political issues, most notably the Syrian civil war, they have been adept at putting those to one side as they continue to cooperate closely on energy. It's worth noting in this context that Turkey had given Russia permission to use its exclusive economic zone for the now dead South Stream project. Finally, a few thoughts on the geopolitical, the broader geopolitical implications of Turkish stream, especially for U.S.-Turkish relations and EU-Turkish relations. Turkey's willingness to host Putin at a time when the West under U.S. leadership was seeking to isolate him as much as possible, and uh, try to force him, as President Obama said on TV yesterday, into changing his behavior through sanctions because of the crisis in Ukraine, and then to proceed to give him an important energy card to play against the West, as well as Ukraine uh, itself, has annoyed both Washington and Brussels. In a recent speech, our good friend Jonathan Elkind, now Assistant Secretary at the Energy Department, who's been following the East-West Corridor issue, uh, like us, in and out of government from the very beginning, said, quote, the US was worried about Turkish stream, though pleased by the cancellation of South Stream, and expressed puzzlement as to uh, what was happening uh, with this project. There was similar criticism that Ed referred to from EU Commission Vice President for Energy, Mr. Sevkovic. However, Turkey can justifiably point uh, to the fact that the current U.S. administration, unlike the Clinton and Bush administrations, has rarely devoted the sustained high-level attention to the development of the East-West Corridor. Uh, and that is a criticism that I, said, I think is, is uh, worth underlining from this podium. And has, uh, uh, and has also to the fact that the EU has not even been able to open the energy chapter in the Turkish EU accession process. To sum up the announcement of Turkish stream, uh, irrespective of whether it comes into being or not, has shaken up the calculations relating to where the supply of gas to Europe would come from, which route it would follow, and the future of the East-West uh, Energy Corridor. However, the biggest immediate questions it raises uh, may be those relating to the Russian domination of the Turkish gas market, and Turkey's continuing willingness to balance its military and political alliance with the West through its growing economic partnership with Russia. Back to you, Andy. Terrific, Bulan. Very, uh, really, really interesting. And from a moderator standpoint, uh, congratulations to all three of you, and my great thanks for <coughs> keeping to your the, the time framework that we that we set forward. Um, particularly as I was listening to you to you, Bulan, uh, it struck me that there's the situation. Uh, 
Mr. Putin in 2014 with China, in which in May there was the signing of a big gas deal at which I would still say there are more questions than there are answers and clear information about it, uh, but that the Chinese um, appeared to be ready to take advantage of a weakened Russian position in negotiations. Um, you know, there was the talk, of course, that there would be the $25 billion forward payment for future deliveries of gas, which did not occur. Uh, we don't know what exactly would be the financing for the, the, uh, uh, the power of Siberia pipeline. Uh, and then even more so, the, uh, the memorandum of understanding that was signed uh, in October in Moscow uh, about uh, the supplying of uh, Western Siberian gas through an, a new Altai pipeline. I mean, this seemed to be even more of an, an improvisation, per, perhaps, and uh, which there are even more, more questions about. So um, <clears throat> I'm wondering uh, if, uh, to what extent you may see uh, Mr. Erdogan in a, in a similar position uh, as um, the Chinese leadership right now, perhaps ready to kind of accept uh, a memorandum of understanding uh, and the possibility of, of, a, of, alter, of an, another alternative, but one in which um, Turkey would be having considerably more leverage than, than Russia and be ready to take advantage of a relatively weakened Russian position. Let me just leave that on the table. There are far more people in the audience uh, that are, uh, there are many people in the audience that are much more knowledgeable about this, so let me open the floor to questions and comments. Uh, please identify yourself for uh, the panelists. We'll collect a few from the start. <laughs> we have, first of all, right here and then right there, yes. One second for the microphone. Uh, Sergey Alexashenko, I have two uh, questions for clarification and one idea for discussion. Uh, clarification on delivery points of contracts between Gazprom and European countries. If entry points are fixed in the contracts, that means your Ukrainian transit cannot go to zero because you cannot reach Slovakia, Czech, Czechia, Austria, or even Italy if you do not go through Ukraine. So is, if it is fixed, that means Ukrainian transit will exist. Otherwise, if Gazprom has negotiation power to change these terms in the contract, it may disappear. So that's, that's why I would like to have clarification. Are those entry points fixed and are non-changeable, non-exchangeable, or it's negotiation? Second, uh, if we look on this map, and if Turkish stream is built, that seems the supply of Russian gas to Bulgaria may be done via uh, Turkish stream, just to make a reverse supply. It's rather cheap and very fast to be done. So uh, Russia, Gazprom may supply gas to Bulgaria via Turkey, but not via Ukraine and Rom Romania as well. And uh, the question, just being Mr. Putin, and w the fourth idea for you, uh, Ed, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, look. There are there are there are many there are many rumors there are many rumors about uh, this uh, east-west corridor, uh, gas corridor to Europe. And Europe is definitely looking for some alternative supplies of gas from Caspian region. And let's imagine that ten years from now, Iran will supply gas somewhere. And uh, Iranian gas to Europe ten years from now, it's a good idea. I think it will be rather cheap and will be possible to build, even if TANAP is built, that means just going next to TANAP, another uh, string, or two, or three, or four, yeah, and there is a flow of Iranian gas to Europe. That's what Europe is dreaming about, and that is what Iran is dreaming about. Mr. Putin is afraid of this, because for him, any alternative supply of gas to Europe, it's a problem for Gazprom. And he's buying, he's purchasing the bottleneck. He's purchasing the entry point to Europe. So supply of gas to the western part of Turkey is just keeping your position. You, you block the entry of any other gas to Europe from south. Yeah? And afterwards, you have a strong negotiation position. Either with Iran, you combine forces, and you say, OK, Europe, please build a pipeline to access. You have no money. We are ready to pay. We are ready to build. And of course, Gazprom gas in this situation will be 50% as the third energy package requires. Yeah? So from my point of view, it's not so stupid if we look a long-run view. 
Yeah? At least Putin can block the entry of any other guest to Europe, or for further negotiations, he can keep position. Thank you. Okay, yes, right over here. Nazar Holt, Pacific North First National Lab, U.S. Department of Energy. I have a question to Ms. Badikov. Could you please show your uh, first slide of your presentation? First. Thank you. So I was wondering why Crimea is marked as a part of Russia. <laughs> why Crimea is marked as a part of Russia. Do you think that the U.S. government is wrong in saying that it was a legal annexation? Do you believe that International community is wrong in saying that Russia is aggressor. You should apologize to million Ukrainians who are suffering from Russian aggression, please. Yes, I'm sorry about that, but uh, I was looking for South Stream uh, pipeline map exactly from the official side. So I took this map exactly from the website. It's, uh, it seems to me over there it's a gas prom. Yeah. So that's why, you know what, they, they, yeah. draw, they draw this It's not map. a political statement. Yes, it's not, you know, just, it's, it's, I, I was not looking for the, you know, countries or something like that. Even I didn't pay attention on that. I was just looking for, you know, the pipeline. <laughs> Point well taken. Yes. Could, could I address the general? Um, delivery points, uh, delivery points the, the, the contracted delivery points are all west of Ukraine. So certainly delivery points can be changed, but they have to be changed by mutual agreement. Uh, Gazprom cannot unilaterally change them. Uh, uh, so, so yes, it, it's possible to, to change. Uh, on the reverse flow to Bulgaria, true, but Bulgaria is insignificant as a gas market. It has an import gas market of about maybe two BCM altogether. Uh, it has already committed about one BCM to, to TANAP and, and, and TAP. So it, it really has no room to take more gas. Uh, and and uh, what's more, Bulgaria, Bulgar Gas already owes uh, Gazprom lots of take or pay penalties that they have never paid. So Bulgaria is not a bankable market for anyone's project. Um, uh, it, it is true, as I intimated, I think, that, that um, this could be a blocking move for other gas uh, coming from, I would say, Azerbaijan, uh, Eastern Med, uh, Northern Iraq, not Iran. Uh, the, the Iranian gas, pipeline gas to Europe is a fantasy. It makes absolutely no economic sense for to move long-haul gas all that way if your gas is offshore and you can liquefy it and, 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 and have east and west market to arbitrage from. So it is something that Iranians are very fond to talk about because it costs you nothing to talk about them. Uh, and, and it makes it seem like you have something to give Europe, but, but it, it, it is no immediate threat uh, to, to Russia for sure. The immediate threat to Gazprom is actually the fact that gas prices are going to be steeply declining in Europe as a result of oil price declines, which usually uh, uh, gas prices lag oil prices. Uh, and and uh, European customers uh, in just in the last month have taken 20% less gas from Gazprom than, than, than previously because European gas uh, storage is full, uh, and anticipating lower, much lower gas prices six months from now, European buyers are not buying much Russian gas right now. Yeah, and uh, to pick up on the third point that you were making, and it's a very important one, about uh, the extent to which uh, Mr. Putin may be playing energy chess, in this case, to try and block uh, the further development of the East-West Corridor. Now, I referred briefly uh, in my historical uh, um, uh, uh, portion of my presentation to when the East-West Corridor idea first emerged. Uh, the Russians, remember the energy, then energy minister was Mr. Shafranik, um, Yuri Shafranik, uh, was opposed to it. Uh, but then Russia was going through a very difficult period. Russia was too weak. And, uh, and ultimately, this was just oil. And when I say just oil, you know, uh, um, this is, you know, maybe Russia would have preferred it to go through Novorossiysk, uh, but it wasn't uh, as threatening uh, 
um, then, 20 years ago, as the gas project, which would compete, which would allow Azeri gas, uh, maybe Turkmen gas, uh, uh, to compete with uh, Russia in its most profitable, profitable market in, in Western Europe is a threat indeed. So, you know, given the, um, his willingness, I'm not a Russian expert uh, like Andy, but given his willingness to use force to protect his national interests in Ukraine, uh, and given the importance of energy, and particularly gas, in, uh, in Russian national power, um, would not Mr. Uh, Putin regard the development of, the further development of the East-West Corridor and turn up uh, and with its provision of alternative gas to, to Western Europe, a threat. So uh, the willingness of Turkey to cooperate in what I call this north-south axis is, of course, very important for Mr. Putin. This is why he's made, uh, well, he made the trip in 2012. He came at the end of 2014. I think he came again in 2010. So, you know, three tri trips. He's hosted Mr. Erdogan a number of times um, as uh, prime minister. I'm not sure whether he went as, as president, but, uh, you know, this is obviously uh, important for uh, uh, Mr. Putin. And um, you know, one note that, uh, that I would uh, add to, to, um, to this is um, even when Nabucco was being discussed, uh, there were statements coming out of Ankara that Ankara would be willing uh, to put Russian gas or help put Russian gas into that pipeline. Now, that seems to me uh, negates the very purpose of the East-West Corridor, which Nabucco was supposed to be. You know, you were supposed to diversify supplies. And if what you did was put Russian gas into a pipeline going through Turkey, what you had was not diversification, but a different route for, for Russian gas. This is, in essence, what we're talking about right now. Because, it, again, if this materializes, it would come to Turkey. Russian gas would come to Turkey and then go to markets. So, you know, going back to, to nine, uh, uh, 20 years ago, when the East-West Corridor came into being, it was trumpeted as uh, allowing the countries uh, in the Caspian region to become independent uh, 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 of Russia, to underline their independence from, uh, from Moscow, and to uh, use the energy transportation issue as a way of underlining that independence. This threatens it. And how it threatens uh, um, that process, we'll just we'll have to wait and see. Yeah, about um, the entering points, yeah, it's changeable. But the problem is that European market is not well developed. So interconnectors, it's just a problem. So EU try to fix it. EU try to fix it. You cannot easily ch send gas from one place to another. You know, it's just it's a very complicated, not easy. If it were well developed, in this case, EU would not have a problem such they have right now, the problem which they have it. So that's why when they have an contract, when they have an entry point, of course it's changeable, but not such dramatically. It's just impossible by, you know, technically it's not, it's not easy. For at least for 30 BCM it will be not easy. As I said, I don't know exactly how many uh, contracts with the whether, you know, will be in force uh, after 2020. But anyway, it's not than 10 BCM. It's much more than 10 BCM. I believe something around 30. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, Zoran Konstantinovic from Croatian Embassy. I'm economic advisor to the Croatian government. Um, just to the point of financing these things, uh, I had a danger of not knowing the details of the Russian statement regarding the changes and giving up on a South Stream. They have come out with a statement which on surface indicates that they're willing to subsidize and provide cheap financing for building the infrastructure necessary to connect this whole story. And considering how difficult and parcelized and, and I mean, basically gas is to finance, how realistic is that? What, because I cannot get to the numbers that Russia has a capacity to even finance this thing in any way without sacrificing some other priorities. I mean, to what extent is there some ability of Russia to help finance this thing, which is generally very difficult to finance on its surface? And I just don't see how they can build a losses on a market basis. Thank you. So the question concerns the, the realistic prospects of, of how much Russia can finance. The European rules don't allow you to have a pipeline that supplies gas to 
Okay. Uh, oh, there, we have two more questions right, right here in the front. The young lady there, and then the young lady in front of her. Hi, Erica Dunham, the Rendon Group. I was just wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on the position that Azerbaijan will be in because of the Turkish stream. You mentioned a few things, uh, Bulent, earlier, and I was just hoping you could give some elaboration. Um, Brenda Schaefer, Georgetown University. I'd like to ask uh, one question and one comment about the idea of a Turkish hub. Uh, we use the term Turkish hub, but if you look at how the contracts are built, it's actually Turkish transit state. There's no, you know, untracted, uncontracted gas coming into and an, to, uh, to uncontracted uh, uh, consumers. So, um, one, should we, so I would just the comment that I think really we should talk about a transit state, and, and two, um, two of the speakers have talked about the geopolitical benefit that being a hub or what I would call a transit state would give to Turkey, but do we have any precedence that being a hub actually connotes any geopolitical ba value? I mean, has Baumgarten become a you know, cosmopolitan center since it became a hub, or, or, or is really, as Ed Chow once said, you know, if you, if, you, if you try to become a hub, it means you're not selling something else. You know, of, of, uh, so what is the geopolitical value? You know, I think I, I'll check what, uh, what I wrote down from my notes, but I think I said the Turkish government's view is that of itself as a hub. And, and I also said that the Turkish government believes that it, has, uh, it enhances its, uh, its international clout. I mean, both are, uh, for the very, uh, because of the points that you made, both are you know, debatable. Uh, but nonetheless, the Turkish government has, uh, this government, uh, along with the previous ones, thought that it was important for these pipelines to traverse Turkey. Um, uh, they, uh, this government, as well as its predecessors, believe that it enhanced Turkish prestige, but your point is, is, is well taken. Um, um, again, um, you know, how much would uh, Turkey's uh, position in, in, uh, uh, in international politics be enhanced by hosting these pipelines? I mean, we have the precedent of 1990, when uh, then-President Azal uh, shut the Turkish-Iraqi pipeline, uh, even before the UN decision. Now, did that hurt uh, the, the regime of Saddam Hussein in, in Iraq uh, before the first Gulf War? Presumably. Did it also hurt Turkey? Uh, yes. So it's a two-edged sword. Um, um, and at a broader level, the question from behind you about Azerbaijan, um, I think it's a fascinating question, and we don't know the answer. Um, now, Azerbaijan is uh, cut off from, uh, from Turkey, ex uh, well, uh, except for the, uh, you know, the, the province of Nakhchivan, which itself is cut off from the rest of Azerbaijan. So therefore, it, it has to go through Georgia in order to get its oil into, into Turkey. Now, Georgia is a troubled country, as we know from uh, back in uh, 2008. It's also susceptible to, to Russian pressure. Now, Russia did not cut off that pipeline uh, in 2008, although they got very close to, uh, uh, geographically to it. Um, and going back, uh, the Russians did not uh, seek to physically prevent the, the pipeline from coming into being. But, you know, uh, I made the point in my presentation that oil, that gas is different to, to oil. I think gas is more important to Russia. Uh, therefore, uh, notwithstanding the apparently cordial relationship between Azerbaijan and, uh, and Russia, um, Azerbaijan's desire to develop the, uh, the, uh, uh, the TANAP pipeline is or may be interpreted by uh, uh, Russia as a threat to its interests. Now, um, I don't know whether uh, this would uh, lead to trouble in the Caucasus. There's certainly enough uh, flash, potential flashpoints, like the Karabakh issue, um, that, uh, that could uh, uh, create problems in, uh, uh, in the region. There are other issues that uh, presumably, uh, if Russia was so inclined, it could use. But if you look at what it's been doing on the other side um, of the, the Black Sea um, in uh, uh, Ukraine, its willingness um, uh, not to take the off-ramps um, that President Obama talked about yesterday and to actually uh, behave the way it has done in spite of the sanctions, which has certainly cost Russia uh, in Crimea and then in eastern Ukraine, um, you certainly have to wonder whether um, uh, Russia may, may be inclined um, to make, shall we say, Azerbaijan uncomfortable uh, as the TANAP project uh, develops. And particularly after you know, putting forward uh, what uh, you know, we have to see as an alternative, even if neither um, the Turkish or Russian governments are saying that this is an alternative to, uh, to, 
Tanakh per se. Uh, you know, the, the issue is, is, is certainly more valid. The issue of what happens to Azerbaijan as a producer of gas that might compete with Russia in world markets is, I think, a, a, a more important one than it was before Turkish Stream was announced. Uh, on the question of financing, uh, it, it is, is my understanding that the Russian position is that they will uh, pay for fund the undersea portion of our Turkish stream, and that Turkey and Russia together would fund the onshore facilities uh, for, for Turkish stream. Uh, it doesn't really answer your question about, you know, what, what happened to the South Stream model where Gazprom, you recall, had 51 percent ownership of all these joint ventures along the way through the Balkans and the, the, uh, the countries like Bulgaria, uh, 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 Serbia, uh, Hungary, and so on had 49 percent ownership of, of a joint venture to move the, uh, that gas. Um, uh, the, the Russian position, as stated on the 17th uh, of January in Moscow, was that that's now Europe's job, uh, given that the third energy package prohibits uh, the, the producer from uh, uh, controlling the transportation um, at, at the same time. Uh, Brenda, you know I have fun with hubs. Uh, people who want to be hubs have just never been to Henry Hub before. Um, and and, and, and I, I think in all seriousness, what, what, what Turkey is really talking about is not being a hub in the sense of a Henry Hub, but so much as a, in the sense of a Singapore or a Rotterdam. Uh, then, uh, and, and for that, I, it just seems to me that Turkey is a long ways off for the kind of well developed banking system, of uh, well-developed commercial law, uh, independent courts that allow international players to want to use uh, Turkey as a trading hub uh, for, 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 for energy. So I, I, I just wonder sometimes uh, when Mr. Yodi said that these two projects were going to have to compete with each other, whether Turkey is looking at the two birds in the bush being better than the bird in hand. Um, uh, in the case of, of TANAP and, and TAP, which is what Azerbaijan has to offer, a, a real project uh, that, that, that has uh, uh, gone through a, a well-documented uh, 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 investment uh, investigation phase, has contracts of, uh, with gas buyers uh, that, that, are, and that, that needs to proceed or an opportunity would be lost. Um, I, I would think that from, from Azerbaijan's point of view, that would be there are SOCAR and BP representatives in the room who can speak much better uh, on the subject. If Russia were to choose a something other than a full Turkish stream uh, uh, option, like a, a blue stream too, kind of option. There actually may be rooms to cooperate. You know, a, 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 a TANAP can transit Russian gas. Uh, a TAP can transit Russian gas. Uh, there, there's nothing inherent uh, in, in the arrangements so that, uh, that it couldn't be a win-win uh, proposition for Azerbaijan and Russian gas, given the economy of scale that's important uh, for the in industry. Unfortunately, the track record in this part of the world is more lose-lose propositions than win-win propositions. So, 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 so I, I, I think that that's really uh, the problem. Yeah. So I agree uh, with um, with the evaluation of what has happened, stuff like this, but. Uh, so, but I don't agree that it's possible that Russian gas will be in TANAP. I don't think so. If TANAP will be out of the southern corridor and regulations of EU, probably yes. But right now, I don't see any points that it's possible to have Russian gas in TANAP. I don't think so. But when it comes to Azeri gas and Russian gas, they, 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 any competition right now? I don't think so. Any competition right now, because when we are talking about Azeri gas, it's only how much now? Right now, 6 BCM and plus 6 BCM, 12 in the, in the Turkish market and 10 will be in, in Europe, yes? But uh, Azeri already has agreements, so they're they have security. There's no competition right now. Uh, but uh, in the future, we'll see. Just a quick comment on the, Rus the, Russian, the Russian financing. You know, timing's, timing's important. 
On December 1st, <coughs> the prospects for the Russian economy looked bleak. On January 17th, they looked pretty catastrophic. Uh, and so I, th I think that when, when, uh, when Nadia said at the outset that the, that the announcement of the decision on December 1st was mainly in, in response to, uh, was, not, was, not a, was not so much of a financing decision, because I guess we don't really know how much less Turkish Stream would cost than Blue Stream in any, in any event, uh, but that it could be explained by, by simply the, uh, the, the legal problems they have, in, they have in Europe. But it's quite telling by January 17th when the announcement's made that, uh, well, you know, once it gets to gets to the border of Europe, well, then that's their issue, and they do all the all the finance all the financing for that. And there, I think the uh, the financial outlook has got to has got to make make a make a difference. Andy, Andy, yeah, uh, can I ask you to to address the issue that I addressed as a as a non-Russian expert on um, uh, Putin perceiving uh, Tanap as a threat to himself and uh, and to economic interests? I'd love to hear your take on it. Uh, well, I would I would agree absolutely <laughs> that, that in my in uh, my my recent nightmare where I imagined I was Mr. Putin and uh, how much less I was worth. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I, th I think any any alternative to uh, gas gas supplies to the to the European market that are not Russian are are viewed as are viewed as threats. Uh, I think that. Uh, I remember uh, four or five years ago when we were working on the Turkey-Russia-Iran project and we had discussions about uh, the pr prospects for Azerbaijan and Turkmenistan uh, resolving an agreement, a disagreement, excuse me, over the Caspian Sea and, uh, and sending, uh, sending Turkmen, Turkmen gas, uh, gas west. Uh, when we talked about it with our Russian interlocutors, I mean, that was almost, it was almost causus belli, uh, as was the, was the response as to what they would do to prevent that from happening. So I would... I would uh, certainly agree with you um, on that point. I mean, the only caveat I would make is that when you, you mentioned that, you know, I mean, gas, uh, gas is more important geopolitically, but certainly for the Russian budget, the oil is, you know, is much more, much more important. It causes about, it's about 4x uh, the contribution to the Russian, the Russian budget, but those are sort of different, different matters. Yeah, let's go back to the, uh, the audience. I think we have time for one more. Uh, Bob Linden with Siemens Corp. I have a very self-interested question. I have a friend who's a Bulgarian who has dreams of LNG. Um, and so I'm wondering with the Trans-Balkan pipeline and the limited demand in Bulgaria, whether there would be a backflow option to get gas, assuming, assuming Turkish Stream happened and there was some way of getting gas into the other end of Trans-Balkan, if that could be an alternate Route. Of course, you have to bet on the probabilities of whether that thing's going to be built or not. So, any thoughts on that? Is Bulgaria just essentially cut as, off? As I said before, Bulgaria has no bankable uh, oh, uh, commitment it can make <coughs> to take gas of any volume for anywhere. Mm -hmm. So they can make any kind of promises that you want. You just can't take that paper to a bank and get money for it. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, it, it, it's the, the idea of an LNG terminal to, to, to uh, serve Bulgaria uh, is frankly ludicrous uh, that, that John Kerry apparently talked about when he was there. Well, I agree with you, sir, but this is a paying client, so I have to do my best. Yes, in the back. Uh, Rich Kosler, it's George Mason University. I want to come back to this competition issue between Azeri and Russian gas. I mean, I could see why Russian gas going through North Stream, for example, wouldn't be competing with, with Azerbaijani gas. But if they're both going essentially through the same or parallel systems to exactly the same market, unless the customers are different, it's got to be competition. And Russia is always going to be in a position where it can undercut the Azeris on, on price just because they can do it. Rich, they can do it, but it's expensive. I mean, it's not cost-free, particularly if you have to build a new pipeline to do it. I mean, uh, right now, Turkey essentially gets a, let me choose my words carefully, it is discounted price from Azerbaijan. Uh, it, 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 um, uh, it, it gets a discounted price by reason of geographic monopoly. 
uh, it gets a discounted price by virtue of uh, uh, the fact that if you want to go beyond Turkey, you have to go through Turkey. So it, it, it gets a pretty nice price uh, uh, from, from, from Azerbaijan. Um, it's interesting, the EU rules, of course, uh, prohibits transit fees. Uh, you can pay pi pipeline tariffs, but you can't pay transit fees for, for monopoly. Not that it applies directly to, to Turkey, but the concept remains that, uh, you know, rather than, in, and I remember negotiating um, with um, the person I call the smartest man in the Caspian uh, Valley, um, uh, Alex Skaroff, that, uh, uh, that, you know, if, if you don't pay a transit fee, then at least you can ought to be uh, selling affordable gas to Georgia or, 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 or Turkey, uh, which, which is in, in effect what's happened right now. So, so yes, you know, Russia has been the incremental supplier. It's been the swing for the Turkish uh, market, which interestingly, uh, uh, Bulan pointed out, is not growing as much as, as Turkey always wants to claim. Uh, Turkey has a history of over, overbooking for gas. Uh, including Iranian gas, as I recall. And just before Blue Stream. Uh, yes, uh, to the point to the point where the Iranians had a flare at the Turkish uh, um, uh, 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 Iranian border to show that Turkey did not uh, fulfill its take or pay commitments uh, to, to Iran. So there is this history, uh, but but um, uh, yes, you, uh, certainly Russia can compete uh, for the Turkish market, but it's, it's, it's at some cost. Okay, let me ask one concluding question for the, for the, for the panelists. Let's, let's dream we're sitting here in 2020, or even 2025. What do you think are the most uh, likely projects uh, that will get done that relate to the Southern Corridor? Who wants to go first? Okay. Hey, I can dream. Um, uh, uh, one new Russian pipeline uh, to, to Turkey. Um, I would do Blue Stream 2, since I'm actually not Mr. Putin, who will probably do Turkish Stream uh, Line 1 uh, by, by, by 2020 and, and TANAP. And, and I, I think the TAP situation is complicated because of the new Greek government which is now talking about reviving ITGI again. Um, and and uh, so, the, so that needs to be sorted through. But, but, but I, I would guess by then that uh, TANAP and TAP will, will, will be flowing. OK, so TANAP, TAP. And one, and one, one line of, of a new Russian pipeline. OK. Um, I'm maybe a little bit optimistic. Um, it seems to yes, it was discussed that uh, uh, Blue Stream as well, and um, but for some reason they at least for for for, for now they decided that the south uh, that the line which they are using right now uh, maybe is the best Turkish uh, stream because of the everything which they goes through the um, sea. Uh, subsea uh, pipelines always uh, cheaper, much cheaper than onshore lines. So that's why probably Russia believe that it will, they will have at least two lines. In this case, that line which they proposed, it's much interesting to them than uh, Blue Stream, because in a Blue Stream, it will be a little bit difficult, and it will be a little bit, not difficult, will be uh, expensive and uh, have a pipeline from that point to the Europe. And I believe that it will be two lines anyway, I think. Because it's one line, it's just the, the, the same amount, about the same amount of gas which Turkey right now has uh, and uh, received from the and Trans Balkans. They can just immediately rid of this line. But, uh, and they can, it seems to me, they can find a market for for the second um, uh, string, but maybe not immediately, but maybe work in progress will be the second um, stream. So I believe that it will be at least two. So maybe um, one is completely finished, but second one maybe in the halfway. In 2020. <laughs> yeah. Bulan. Najia, did I hear you say that it's 
cheaper to build underwater pipelines? It's so always when it crosses the pipeline, when it crosses the, not only your own territory, but cross the, the um, neighboring country or something. Yeah, it's always it's cheaper when you have a. So, um, uh, but from, you know, because you need to, uh, you spend more time, you need to go through the regulations. So. I mean, I defer to Ed. Uh, uh, on this issue, but uh, my understanding is it's much cheaper. You want to go, and then I'll pick up on, on the well, question. I mean, the fact of the matter is the Russians built the, the pipeline that would have served South Stream all the way from Western Siberia to the Rus Russian Black Sea coast, plus boosted the compression station for a total of five billion or, 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 or so. I mean, the subsea portion would have cost 20 billion uh, at a minimum, I would have thought. Yep. Um, and just to, uh, um, uh, mentioned something that I think should have been mentioned uh, long before the end of this meeting. I mean, we're all assuming that, uh, that, uh, um, uh, uh, that South Stream was for real and the Turkish Stream is for real. What if, what if both were designed uh, to actually uh, provide uh, um, uh, Putin um, uh, the, the appearance of, um, of an alternative but he's actually hoping that somehow uh, that Ukraine will crack, the resolve of the West will crack, and then the pipelines that go through Ukraine, to Ukraine and through Ukraine, uh, will continue to uh, uh, be functional with a more compliant government. Should we call it the Finlandization of, uh, of Ukraine, perhaps, is, is, is uh, you know, in, in the minds of, of, of uh, Putin, that none of these, so to go to get to your question, maybe just like South Stream, Turkey Stream will not get built. Um, and, uh, and I think the Blue Stream, uh, it, you know, they've already boosted the, the capacity from 16 billion cubic meters to, to 19. Uh, that might be boosted even further, because I think the, uh, the Turkish market uh, is important in itself to, to Turkey. Turkey is an important ally in, uh, uh, for, for Russia in so many ways. I mean, Turkey is balancing its commitment to its Western allies with its uh, relationship with Russia, and I think that will continue. We're not in the Cold War. It's, uh, it's something that, uh, that Turkey have, has every right to do. But uh, uh, the, uh, when you look at, at the relationship from the other side, it may be that Putin is using the Turkish connection in order to, to leverage himself into a better position vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Kiev and vis-a-vis -vis Kiev's backers, and maybe he uh, ultimately does not intend to spend all that money uh, building South Stream, but is hoping that, uh, that the little green men and their buddies uh, can actually uh, make Ukraine um, more pliant uh, to his geopolitical uh, goals. Uh, there still remains the question of whether TANAP uh, will provide an alternative uh, 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 source of energy. And, and, and there I'm, you know, I'm pessimistic. I think uh, Mr. Putin's willingness to use force uh, indirectly or certainly take this very tough line um, on, on Ukraine, Crimea and Ukraine, um, makes it, I think, more likely that he will be uh, willing to use that elsewhere. I mean, he's already shown in 2008 that he's willing to make trouble, uh, in uh, direct trouble uh, in, in Georgia. And I would not be too, uh, too surprised if uh, uh, the Caucasus uh, begins to heat up again in a way that uh, uh, serves Russian interests. Anyway, with that, I'll stop. Nope. So, you know what? Uh, do I see a ton up happening? Oh, y yes, if I'm being optimistic. But uh, uh, in my pessimistic moments, I, I think that there might be trouble um, as it begins to, to be built. Okay, I noticed that nobody uh, mentioned the possibility of a, of a Turkmen Azeri connector. <laughs> yes, okay. Well, after what's transpired in the past year, I wouldn't be surprised at almost anything. Uh, and uh, I think we were in some very, very, very unpredictable uh, and dangerous, dangerous times. So, but uh, to, to not end on such a pessimistic note, let me uh, thank uh, Nadja and Ed and Bulent for leading such an interesting discussion and thank you for attending today. And we'll look forward to continuing the uh, uh, the discussion at some point in the not too distant future. Thank you very much.